Hey everybody, it's Matt Powers. I'm an author, seed saver, gardener, permaculturist, and family guy. And I teach people all over the world how to live more regeneratively. And today I want to answer a question that I get all the time. <laughs> Heard that one before? Um, and it's about reading the weeds. I talk about how we can use the plants that are there, that are showing up, that are sometimes not welcome, sometimes spiky, sometimes spiny, sometimes annoying. And they're always telling us something. They're always accumulating nutrients. Their root systems are always telling us something about the soil structure and what the soil needs. So let's dive into this. Let's get this going. <laughs> so behind me right here is a really good place to start. We can see that this hill is compacted. We can see that this hill isn't doing well. Um, there are places of erosion. Uh, we can actually come down here. We see that there is, is this real hard hard clay soil it's 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 almost like a concrete it's it's very um brittle as well see it just erodes right away i don't want to do too much here i don't want to um send it more into erosion but do you see how this was cut at some point and it never sealed up with plants it never turned into anything but this adobe cut in the ground because the ground essentially is so much clay it's like it's adobe so what would grow here what what would we see in terms of root structure do you think well let's go look let's just let's just see so i was over here and i noticed dandelions essentially and we always talk about how dandelion roots um go down really deep um and penetrate the soil see how the soil here is just crumbly so this could be i mean where it's hard it's really hard but where it's broken it's just so crumbly so we could have a combination of things happening here let's just look at it so here we go so as you can see there's a, a taproot and it broke off but it's just this taproot and there's a few other side roots, but it's mostly this one taproot that went way down and we didn't even get it all out. So um, what about up here? What about here at this, uh, this is scotch broom. Let's see what this looks like. Um, and again, it is that, that taproot, that deeper taproot that's going down to hold it, to root it in place. And when this breaks down, when this expands, it is biological tillage as well. So let's go to an area that is maybe sandier, maybe down here on the ground, right here actually would be a great spot. Okay, so we're here down on the ground and we've got these weeds that are spreading. They're, they're, they're clumpers and they spread. These little flowers in the end, I definitely would suspect that they're putting off um, seeds at a certain point and spreading themselves even further. This is loose, but underneath the sand, it's hard pack again. So we might see that th these are actually, um, we might see that these are actually a combination. So we can see here that it does have that deep root, but it's also starting to feather out, starting to leg out. But let's keep going. This is now mulch. What about in the garden? where the soil's already been loosened. What, what, are, what kind of weeds are we gonna get here? All right. Okay. So here's the classic dandelion. Let's see what uh, it's doing here. So, Different than we see over in the severe compaction area, we've got a much thicker stemmed, wetter stemmed um, dandelion. And this dandelion's root structures are spreading outward. They're not just going straight down. There's way more lateral movement. This soil is doing a lot better than that hill. And even as we dig into it, we can see that it goes right down to compaction pretty quick. And we have that compost that I added, but then we have this soil. You know, we need to add some compost tea. Maybe we need to rip some more or go through the, the full breakdown and cover this with all this stuff to see more change. 
But right here, right now, we're seeing that this is the next step. There's compaction here, no doubt. But there is more nutrition flowing through this because of the compost and because of the root structures of, of the plants around them. It's this diversity of plants and plant roots around them that is giving that economy the kind of license to grow this many roots and to exchange this much. So this is a really good indicator of the soil food web and the soil going through the motions and beginning the process. Yeah, and it's just from pulling up a weed. All right, so we're here in the garden and we've got chickweed. We've got this chickweed. Let's pull this up. So these roots form a fine mesh underneath the surface and they hold the loose soil together. This is all really loose soil. Um, really doesn't uh, have much structure. There's gravel in here. So it's trying to hold the soil structure together. Do you see how loose it is? And so in here we have weeds that are going to have different roots. They're going to be more feathery. They're going to form a mat together. Um, and they're going to hold it together and then break down in place and form a connected soil network right there. So this is a legume right here. Um, and if we pull it up, we see that its root, come on now. That it, you see that its root is just that tap root. And there's a little one right here and a little one right there. But it's this primarily this tap root action that's happening so that it can get to water and survive because oh boy, is this soil dry and hard. And it's that dry hardness that makes it so difficult to risk putting out those feathery, thinner, smaller, finer mesh network of, of roots. The roots tell us about the soil quality, they tell us what the soil needs, and they tell us where, where things are at, especially if we start looking at those finer root hairs. Now, we've looked at the roots, we've seen how, you know, the root hairs, the finer root hairs, the uh, mesh that forms, that mat that forms, it's all about holding the soil together. And then the deeper taproot, the more solitary roots that go much deeper, they're there to anchor the plant, to make sure that it gets enough moisture, and to push through that compaction. So maybe you have a combination of these two things on certain plants or the plants themselves change the way that their root system is working to adapt to that soil type. You can see it when you pull it up. And then the next question is, how do you know what plants bioaccumulate? So I'll tell you a secret. There are databases where these things are tested and they're publicly available because they're part of the USDA. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been testing the phytochemical makeup of plants for a long time. And you can look these things up. This is how, you know, when you look at the back of a can of soup or uh, the description of a food, it tells you the nutritional values because they've actually mapped these things on average from certain test sites and test farms. So the USDA Dr. Duke's phytochemical database is a wealth of information. You might get lost there. <laughs> I certainly do. And you might recognize that while it's incredibly useful, it is also just a sampling. And so you may have things that do better in other areas or do worse in other areas. So it's just an average. It's a sampling. One of the most important things that I've learned by going through the database is that what we think of as nitrogen or potassium or, or you know, um, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. It, it, when we think of what accumulates what, it's really fascinating because when you get into it, when you start really looking at these things, you realize that, you know, beans are not the leader in nitrogen. Um, you realize that certain things really bring in the calcium, certain things really bring in the magnesium, and you can plant for this. You can, you can uh, map these things out. I've been going through the database for a while now, creating special plant groupings, plant guilds, specific for nutrition, specific for remediation, and then also understanding, you know, which plants we need to be testing. Just 
for an example, something that everyone should know. Aluminum bioaccumulates the most in cucumbers. And so a protocol that I am thinking about is, you know, you gather up all those cucumbers, you know, you juice them and then you test that juice. And then if it's high in aluminum, then you know that your, your, your soil is high in aluminum. There are things that accumulate lead. There are things that accumulate nitrates. There are things that accumulate all these different dangerous heavy metals and even radiation. And we can test these things, especially when they're focused in plants we know are, are designed to bioaccumulate them. And then from there, we can juice them. We can you know, turn them into something that's easy to test, like a liquid. And we can send them out to be tested. We can put them in water and send them out to be tested at a, at a drinking facility or water facility. There's so many different ways that we can get this information. But unless we know which plants, unless we know um, what to test for, how to test for, who to go to, unless we're prepared or unless we're thinking about this, we're not going to know what's in our soil. We're not going to know what our soil needs and what we can give back and what we can balance. The contamination in Flint, the contamination in Fresno, contamination being found all over. We can test for this. We can treat it. We can use iron and phosphorus in the soil or iron and phosphorus bioaccumulating plants that we till into the soil. And we can combine that lead and phosphorus in situ with that lead. Well, we don't combine it, right? Uh, the life and the, the, the action in the soil is combining it. You know, we're just setting the stage and nature's doing it, which is really what permaculture is all about. And it forms pyromorphite crystals. And these pyromorphite crystals, I know it sounds like pyromaniac, um, are not bioavailable and they are not soluble. So your plants can't uptake them. It's not going to be leaching out of your soil into your groundwater. You've taken care of the problem. And there are solutions like that for everything. So I want to go through it. I want to map this all out. And that's why I started this whole Kickstarter, Permaculture Soil Science and Solutions. I have a ton of this information already. I've got the book basically already written. Um, I've already written a ton about this information, been researching this and working with experts for years. But we don't have the complete protocols for remediation for all the specifics because they're different. We don't have the protocols for testing and reading those tests for all those different things. And I wanted to put it in one place, in one location, so that we all have a reference on how to remediate, how to build soil in a div total like fluent diversity. So you're like Korean natural farming over here, and you're doing you know the Dan Kittredge mineral stuff all throughout, and you're doing the Elaine Ingham stuff here, and you're doing the vermicomposting thing there. And it's this combination of fluency that will get us to where we really want to be, where we can produce what we want. We can get the reactions we want. We can get the, the heavy this or the light that, and we can create soils and solutions that we can use to treat soils and plants to improve them to the specific requirements that they have. And that's what it's about, is that mapping that complexity, opening that door. I want to create a fluency so the people who are brought up in the universities can talk to the people doing Korean natural farming, doing Elaine Ingham's methods, doing all of this because the reality is they need to see the value in what we're doing and we also need to be able to communicate it. So I want to bring all this together. I want to get stuff like high rows, ABCs of organic agriculture, that kind of understanding as well into this whole fluency. So I want to go to all the edges. I want to tie in all the amazing things that are going on right now in soil and soil science. And I really want people to, to understand what's possible. Um, and like I said, the, the database is out there. The data is out there. The journals, the, the science journals are out there. Um, there's just thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. Um, and so... <laughs> It's, it's really about condensing all this down into best practices and what's right and so that we have a comprehensive, organized understanding. And we can bring that to schools and colleges and workshops and our homes and make a real difference in people's lives now. Not six years from now and not when, you know, that, that research finally becomes understandable. Like, let's make this happen now and let's make this open to everyone and make it really, really powerful. So that's what the Kickstarter is all about. Permaculture science, soil... <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
<laughs> permaculture soil science and solutions and it ends in just five days so click the link check out the kickstarter there's amazing bonuses and there's classes starting off just at twenty dollars fifty dollars um, you can get into the advanced permaculture student line at an incredible discount as well there's all these amazing things so check that out before it ends because it ends soon thank you so much and keep reading your weeds